Recall that two graphs, G and H, are isomorphic, and this is the notation, if and only if there exists a bijection alpha from the vertex set of G to the vertex set of H, such that alpha of U alpha of V is an edge of H if and only if UV is an edge of G. This condition is what's telling you that the bijection alpha preserves adjacency and non-adjacency. Quick question. It seems like you would be able to determine if two graphs are isomorphic using their adjacency matrices. How would this work? All of the information in a graph is contained in its adjacency matrix, so it definitely is possible to determine if two graphs are isomorphic using just their adjacency matrices. And in this video, I'll show you how. It turns out that G is isomorphic to H if and only if AG is equal to P times AH times P transpose for some permutation matrix P. And notice here that AG represents the adjacency matrix of graph G and AH represents the adjacency matrix of graph H. We're going to take a look at how this works using an example. So our graph G will be a green graph on these five vertices, and I'll just label them. Our graph H is going to be a red graph, also on five vertices. Because I chose such a small example, it should already be pretty clear that these two graphs are essentially the same, in other words, isomorphic. But it will be useful to work through all of the steps in this example anyways. If we wanted to find an isomorphism between these two graphs, let's consider what bijection we might use. We'll take alpha to map from V of G to V of H, and we'll say that alpha can map vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of G to vertices 5, 4, 1, 2, 3, respectively, in H. A different notation for this is alpha equals, in brackets, 1, 5, 3, and then in brackets, 2, 4. This tells us that 1 goes to 5, 5 goes to 3, and then 3 goes back to 1, and also tells us that 2 goes to 4, and 4 goes back to 2. That's known as cycle notation for this bijection alpha. In order to prove that alpha is indeed an isomorphism, we would need to check every pair of vertices in the graph G and show that if they were adjacent in the graph G, then after the mapping, they get mapped to a pair of vertices that are adjacent in the graph H. And also, if they were not adjacent in the graph G, then they need to map to a pair of vertices which are not adjacent in the graph H. To demonstrate this, I'll just go through two little examples. We notice that 1, 2 is an edge in the graph G. So alpha 1, alpha 2 ends up being 5, 4, which is an edge in the graph H. So that worked. Next, we notice that 1, 4 is not an edge in the graph G. And alpha of 1, alpha of 4 maps to 5, 2, which is not an edge in the graph H. So those two examples worked out. If you want, you can check for yourself that alpha is indeed an isomorphism, but hopefully at this point you're pretty convinced that it will work. To see how we would view this in terms of matrices, we'll start by writing down the adjacency matrices of the two graphs. So we'll use green to represent the adjacency matrix of the graph G. It's going to have five rows corresponding to the five vertices and five columns also corresponding to the five vertices. If we look at the first row, vertex 1 is adjacent only to vertex 2. So that means we put a 1 in the 2 column and zeros everywhere else. Similarly, we can fill in the rest of the adjacency matrix. If you'd like a review of the details of how an adjacency matrix is made, click on this video or see the links in the description below. We build the adjacency matrix of the graph H in exactly the same way and we end up with these two adjacency matrices. Our next step is to determine if there is a permutation matrix P such that P times the adjacency matrix of H times P transpose will give us the adjacency matrix of G. This problem of finding the permutation matrix P is essentially equivalent to finding a mapping alpha like we did before. If you find such a matrix P, it will be associated with a mapping alpha. And if you find a mapping alpha, it will be associated with a permutation matrix P. So since we already know that our mapping alpha worked out, 
let's use that to try to build ourselves a nice permutation matrix. We have to remember what alpha does. And in particular, alpha maps one to five. So in row one, we'll put a one only in the fives column and zeros everywhere else. Similarly, we fill in the rest of the permutation matrix according to what alpha tells us to map to. To find P transpose, remember that the transpose of a matrix is found just by swapping rows for columns. So if we look at our old matrix P and we find the first row, that gives us our first column in P transpose. And we just finish off and write down P transpose. Our next step is to take a look at the product we get when we take P times AH times P transpose. Okay, so let me copy and paste our matrix P and copy and paste our matrix AH and also P transpose. Now, because multiplication of matrices is associative, I'm just gonna go ahead and multiply the first two together. You've probably seen matrix multiplication before, but let me just remind you that if you're looking for the entry in row one, column one of the product, what you need to do is to look at row one of the first matrix and column one of the second matrix. And you look along that row and along that column and you take the dot product. What that means is that you just multiply corresponding entries and keep doing that, multiplying corresponding entries, but you take the sum of all of that. If you do that in this particular example, you're gonna get a zero here. If I'm looking for the next entry that's gonna go into the first row, I still look at the first row of the first matrix, but now I look into the second column and I again take that dot product. Again, I get a zero. And I'm gonna get a zero again until I get to the fourth column. I will end up getting a one there. So that tells me to put a one in the product. And the last entry is zero. Check all of this for yourself. Now we're done with the first row in the product. To figure out the second row, we just repeat this procedure, but now looking at the second row of the first matrix, and again looking into every individual column of the second matrix. Once we're finished calculating the product of these two matrices, we are not done. We still need to multiply that product by P transpose. So I'll copy P transpose, and now we just have to run through all the matrix multiplication again. We work out the product of these two matrices again using matrix multiplication. And after you finish that, you'll notice that the corresponding matrix you get is exactly the adjacency matrix of the graph G. So that's precisely what we were looking for. We found a permutation matrix that satisfied the property we were looking for. Actually, we did it in a little bit of a roundabout way because we found that permutation matrix by already knowing an alpha mapping that would work. But again, I'm reminding you that finding this permutation matrix is as difficult as finding the mapping alpha. Once you know one, you know the other. If you have any graph theory questions, let us know in the comments below. Click here for related videos and keep having fun with graph theory. I'll see you next time.